you. Welcome back to another exciting episode <laughs> with Live with Dr. O, and I'm Ron, obviously Dr. O. And today we're going to talk mainly about rattlesnake, mm-hmm. rattlesnake prevention, how to help your dogs around rattlesnakes potentially, and then avoidance, rattlesnake avoidance, avoidance that's prevention. Probably work. Good. We'll talk about that too, but that's. <laughs> like stop rattlesnakes just stop that one <laughs> that won't do it <laughs> and then we're, we'll kind of touch on some of the heat stroke uh, items if that we, we have, have time, on yeah. there and then we might expand that even to the next episode depending on how much we get through Absolutely. so go ahead and take it away okay hi everybody I'm so glad you're watching and feel free to engage in conversations and um, Ron I'm the paper and pencil person Ron's We'll be answering your questions. I'm answering your questions. There you go. So, <laughs> so send any questions you have, and um, I'm hoping that they'll be vast because this is a it's a legitimate concern because we down here in Mesa we live in one of the highest um, densities of rattlesnakes in the entire country, um, and definitely on the west side of the country. And the numbers change every single year, especially with the migration of the rattlers um, and <laughs> um, and the green Mojaves. They're one of my faves. Um, so. Um, the numbers say that we have in uh, Arizona and Southern Arizona something on the order of, depending on what kind of research you have, somewhere between 17 and 23 different kinds of venomous snakes here. So um, it's concerning. And the idea that the snakes are the bad guys, the idea that the snakes are our problem, it's not true. Okay, so we moved into the snake's property, we moved into the snake's backyard, and then we expect the snakes to let us in, like coming home and having somebody else in your bathroom. Like, oh, you know what, it's okay, you can stay here, I won't get mad and I won't grab my gun. It's not gonna work that way. So we go out there, we hike, we camp, we do construction, uh, we do all kinds of things with hunting and those types of uh, activities, and we bring our dogs. (laughs) And, um, And many of us, including myself, we don't keep our dogs on leashes, and we have a good time hiking and camping in the area where the snakes are places where we're never going to see them. And so the idea that our animals are going to get bitten by snakes, um, high propensity, high probability, high chances, and the idea that we need to be prepared when that happens um, is 100% truism with our choice to live here. And I want to point out, not only can you get a snake while camping, hiking, and outdoor activities, but this time of year when it, we hit triple digits, some of those snakes like to hide in our garages mm-hmm. That's right. out here. And then all of a sudden our dogs are going wild, wanting to get at the garage door. We think they want to go out for a car ride. Next thing you know, there's a snake, snake attack. Yeah. So yeah. be really, really careful with uh, snakes hiding in your garage. In your backyard, underneath your decks, those types of things. because that snakes are just there to be comfortable. So um, the chances of having a non-venomous snake in Arizona, it's possible, but um, I was doing some yearly reading about these little darlings, and um, in the state of Arizona, you actually have to have a hunting license to kill a rattlesnake, Um, and it has to be uh, valid and uh, up to date, and I don't know how many people actually abide by that, but the idea of killing a snake, a rattlesnake, um, I do know people that do that, unfortunately. Um, but it's their house, their backyard, and on the website, hopefully when we're done here today, we'll be able to post many options for people. If you see a rattler anywhere, you see a snake anywhere, to make some phone calls. Arizona um, State Retrieval and Removal um, uh, Companies, there's some that are part of the state. Um, there's actually two, one of them is federal. But um, they'll actually come out to your house or come out to wherever you are and they will remove the snake and relocate it without killing it, which as far as I'm concerned is amazing. Um, I do want to tell you a a little story. When I moved to Prescott, I was walking down the street and there are two boys come up the street to me and they said, um, um, there's a snake, there's a snake in the road, there's a snake in the road. I'm like, all right, well, you know, what do I care? It's a snake in the road. And... uh, they're like, pull me down, call me down for it. And so the snake is trying to get off the road onto the sidewalk and it was all housing. And they were like, oh my gosh, maybe it's a rattler, maybe it's this, maybe that. So it's a Sunday, I call um, animal control and I wanted to relocate the snake. <laughs> so animal control switches over to somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. And I get a woman on the phone. I said, okay, well, there's a snake on the sidewalk in front of the house and there's a bunch of people and there's tons of traffic. I'm mostly concerned about the snake getting run over or having a dog eat it or something like that. And um, the lady on the phone says, okay, we'll send somebody out. Okay, not even three minutes later, a full size fire ladder truck comes down the road straight at me. I'm like, what the heck is that? Turns out in the city of Prescott, um, there is no animal control on Sunday, 
and all the emergency calls go to fire. So, <laughs> so fire alarms are going off, the fire truck's coming down the road, they pull off the side of the road like it's an emergency, and these wonderful firefighters jump off the top of the fire truck, and they have their bucket, and they have like some sort of tongue thing, and they said, ma'am, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm okay, the snake's right there. And this guy goes up, he goes, he goes, well, ma'am, that's not a rattler at all. I said, okay. I said, okay, that's not why I called you guys. I just don't want the snake to get hurt. And this other guy jumps out and he goes, ma'am, I'm like, oh, somebody else, one more person calls me ma'am today. It's over. And so he jumps in and he goes, and he stands there with his tongs in his bucket. And he says, well, ma'am, that's simply a bull snake. I went, okay. He goes, bull snakes? eat rattlers. I said, okay. And then he goes, I have bull snakes on my property. I said, okay, do you want another one? And he goes, he goes, hmm. And he sticks, he gets the bull snake, he sticks in his white bucket, he jumps back up on the back of the truck, and they drive away. And I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm like, I'm, it's like Sunday brunch, and I called you guys. <laughs> and they sent out like full fire regalia. So there might be other options other than waking up the fire department for a snake in your house. Although they told me really cool rattlesnake stories about people that called and had rattlers in their front doors, uh, trying to get some, I guess, cool for this, um, yep. the summer. But um, we'll go ahead and post. There's actually quite a few 1 uh, 800 numbers and stuff you can use if rattlers are bothering you. So, that being said, um, the dogs in Arizona, the stats say that they're 25% 25, 25 higher mortality in dogs than there are in humans. And um, the mortality numbers are kind of crazy because there's not a huge death toll because of rattlers in Arizona, whether it be dog or cat or humans. They hurt a lot, they cause a lot of damage, and we'll talk about that. But with regard to mortalities, it's the same story you get with many other things, including COVID at this time, I would guess. There's uh, the young, the elderly, and the ill, uh, or um, compromised immune system. We don't want to get bitten by snakes, right? So that being said, the medicine piece out. Um, Quite a bit of time ago, I wrote a book, um, and it was called Take Two Bones and Call Me in the Morning, Holistic First Aid for Dogs and Cats. Uh, um, it had a very large section on rattlesnakes, and or snake bites, and the clinical signs of snake bites um, are much like getting hurt by anything else, and we'll go over those um, brief, shortly. The thing that I have, um, that we get phone calls about in the animal hospital, and people need to know. Um, what are the signs of a rattlesnake bite and how do you know you're in trouble and how do dogs detect rattlesnakes three totally different topics but they're important to know especially if you're going to choose to bring your dogs out in arizona anywhere um and uh the rattlesnake avoidance training so um with regard to how is it that dogs detect rattlesnakes right how do dogs detect anything their sense of smell sense of smell sense of smell hearing i guess um and then um visual but if you've ever been around Rattler, I grew up in San Diego and I've been around lots of Rattlers. And the thing is that if you see it, you're too close, right? Too close because they, they warn you, right? Um, and for dogs, they smell it. So there are quite a few uh, rattlesnake avoidance training um, that um, are advertising in this state. And each one of those avoidance training um, classes, they have different ideas on how it is to train dogs um, away from snakes. So um, some of them use scent, some of them use sound, and some of them I just honestly can't figure out what they do. I don't, I mean I don't, because some of the some rattlesnake avoidance um, companies, they defang the snakes, and which I think is cruelty to animals, to be perfectly frank with you. Um, and then some of them tape their snouts together like this, um, and some of them um, leave them fully intact and just have them in double um, wired cages, so even as they strike and they do their normal snake things, they don't have contact with your dog. So everyone has different techniques. Um, I myself got my dog's uh, rattlesnake aversion train um, through a company called Hunter K9, and they have full, um, full tactical snakes, and um, they use them for a short period of time, and then they set them free again, is what my understanding is last time I spoke with them. And um, using the scent of the smell of the snakes and the sound of the snakes um, to uh, teach aversion to the dogs, um, hopefully that works, and hopefully you're in a situation where your dog ha is, I guess, downwind of the snakes, but with the sense of smell that snakes, um, dogs have, it shouldn't really be an issue. All that being said, I, don't, I think that's one piece of safety. One of the other pieces is that if your dog is barking at something on your hike, <laughs> please call your dog off. Um, your 
having a uh, recall on your dogs regardless of how high drive they have if they have to be getting to something like let's say bronze dogs terriers terriers prey drive go, go, <laughs> right and they'll be like barky 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 and the idea of calling dogs like that off when they get this high drive you know yeah. difficult right oh, yeah. I, mean, I, I actually can't imagine it's like calling. tunnel vision and nothing else they can see except for their prey and if their or prey snow. on that day happens to be a rattlesnake we're gonna have problems right and uh if, if a dog is barking at something in the bushes, if you get recall to get your dog off, excellent. Word of advice, if that happens, walk the other direction. Do not go to the bushes to find out what the dog was barking at. I had three clients in my practice in Vegas that did that, and that was a really, really, really bad idea because the dog is barking at a snake. So um, if your dog says, especially if they're avoidance trained, and they say, bark, 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 and your dog goes that way, Follow your dog. Do not go to find out what the heck they were barking at because, I don't know, human curiosity, I'm not really sure, but uh, if you trust your dog, you ever um, aversion trained your dog, or your dog has a barking attack and you pull them off of it, do not go investigate what your dog yeah. is barking at, okay? Because um, we can't get you hurt, and we certainly don't want to send your dog back to the place where they saw something that might well be a snake. Um, in an effort to uh, defend their humans, they may well get hurt. <laughs> so that happens. Um, so um, if, in the event that your dog does get bitten um, by a snake, or you think they do, um, it is going to, first of all, it is going to be a, probably a loud yipe, um, and the all your patients, all your dogs, they're going to be painful and they're going to be scared. Okay. So you're in a situation where you have an acute situation of your dog being pure, fearful, painful, and possibly going after the snake that bit them, depending on the breed of the dog. Um, so when you go to help your dog, hopefully you're helping your dog get in the car to go straight to the emergency hospital. Because regardless of your rattlesnake um, vaccine status, which we'll talk about, you have to get to the emergency hospital. Time is of the essence if you get bitten. And even if you don't know what kind of snake it is, even if you don't think it's a um, venomous snake, you have to get to the hospital. Um, the tissue damage and the neurological damage and the hematological damage, which is the red blood cell um, supply, especially if you get a green Mojave, it has to be taken care of immediately. Um, so the issue with the situation like that is, we talked about this during some anxiety talks a couple weeks ago, is that the humans have to stay calm. We have to keep our dogs as calm as possible. And the idea of being calm in a situation like that, I, I can't imagine how difficult it is, but the, um, making sure that your dog stays as calm as possible for the transport to the hospital. Um, I believe that there's three kinds of people in an emergency situation. Mm. They're the people that scream. They're the people that freeze. Oh, Are you a screamer? <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry that he just actually said that out loud. Uh, <laughs> um, so there's the screamers. Apparently he's a screamer. And then there's the freezers that just like they're, they've got non-functional. And then there's kind of the doers. They're the people that are going to move forward when something happens and figure out how to do things. Um, the screamers, if you're a screamer and something happens to your dog or you're out hiking or camping and you see a snake, move away, try to be as calm as possible. And if you're a screamer, don't go swooping your, snake, your dog up and run it to the car and get it to the hospital because that kind of anxiety for you is not going to be helpful for the dog and a painful, anxious dog may well bite you. Yeah. I mean, they may, they may well bite you and then you've got this like secondary or tertiary problem on the way to the veterinary hospital yeah. and then on the way to the human hospital. That's a good point. You know, when we talk about in our previous talks about fear free and, mm -hmm. um, you know, fear, anxiety, stress in the pet makes them do things that um, would be considered aggression otherwise. You're yes. going to be the nicest pet gets bit by a snake mm -hmm. and then you pick it up and it will completely attack you yeah. because you're in a, in a defensive mode. And so it's really important not to get yourself hurt trying to get your dog out of a situation. And the, um, and the idea that your dog or cat, oh, God forbid, may have gotten bitten from something they didn't even see. They got hurt by something that's pseudo invisible. Um, they could smell it and they were looking for it, but the idea that it would come after you. Um, and that, Ron, what you said about fear free is beautiful because if we have um, adaptable if we have other kind of fear free products in the car that at least we could spray in the environment or at least we could try to kind of tone down things a little bit and I can't guarantee how much things like that would work in a kind of an emergency it's not kind of an emergency it actually is an emergency situation like this um, but anything we could do to keep the situation as calm as possible plus you're gonna be driving a car 
with a dog that just got bit by a snake. So safety first with driving. And <laughs> when I used to teach these classes, I used to tell, ask people to have all the emergency phone numbers for their um, animal hospitals on a little piece of paper or I guess jacked into your phones. And um, if you don't have a buddy that's making the phone call to the emergency hospital while you're driving, please, 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 in the state of Arizona, do not call or text while you're driving. Because having a secondary accident with you or God forbid you hit somebody, again, it's not gonna help your dog. So safety first for all parties involved. It's not like you're, everyone's not having a bad enough day to begin with. So um, if your dog gets bit by a snake and or you think they get bit by a snake. And there's plenty of other creatures out in Arizona that will bite you, bite, will, will envenomate you um, or your dog, whether the Gila monsters or the tar tarantulas are the safest thing on the planet. These may be scorpions, things like that. Mm -hmm. Tarantulas, do not fear the scorpion. I mean the tarantula. Scorpions hurt. Um, some of the other animals in Arizona hurt. They will cause a beipe. And some of them can envenomate your animals and not be a snake. Centipedes. Uh, it's not centipedes. <laughs> um, but um, some of the clinical signs for your dog and or cat, possibly. Um, the best spot, to be honest with you, to get bitten by a snake is going to be your legs. And it can also be your face to some degrees. Um, you want to have um, time to, if you can, watch your dog. Because the doctor at the emergency hospital is going to ask you, okay? It can be a bleeding wound. Um, it can be extreme pain. It's excitement, panting, drooling, vomiting, diarrhea, collapse, seizures and dilated pupils, which is a fear response. We learned that with Fear Free a couple weeks ago. Um, that being said, all of that is nice to know. I'm panting, I'm vomiting, I'm having a diarrhea, I had a seizure, I am extremely painful, I don't want mom to touch me, those types of things. Oh, all of that's important to protect yourself and make sure that your dog is as safe as possible in transport, but get to the hospital. You, I mean, there's, there, there, you have to be at the hospital. I've heard of people that go ahead and they give their dog to aspirin and they hope they feel better because the swelling in their face is bad, so they give them some anti-inflammatories. Um, the uh, venom of snakes, it will, um, once it's in, you've been envenomated, um, topical things, wrapping things, tourniquet things, <laughs> They're not, they're not going to help, okay? We want to make sure that um, the stress level is down, the blood pressure is down, the movement of blood is down as much as, as, much as possible. But adding an ice pack, adding a topical, um, other types of things like that, even um, if you have to move your dog long distances, some people think to do, do the um, tourniquets to stop the blood flow from going up towards the brain or the heart or those types. Don't do that, okay? The thing is that the damage to the muscles and the damage to all the tissue where the venom is just sitting there stewing will cause more damage long term and a bigger problem for your emergency veterinarians, guaranteed. Um, then, um, <laughs> If, uh, if you ever watch Westerns, um, you know that the whole, <coughs> or maybe other places oh, were dead. <laughs> um, if you ever got the whole muzzle your dog and um, suck the venom out of the wound, okay? I actually met two people that did that. Um, and they thought that that was the way that you did things. Or you make the little hash mark cut across a snake wound so that you can push the venom out of the wound. Okay, please, please, please do not do that. Uh, it, like, but those, because of the books I read, they said you might have worked for John Wayne. It's just not going to work for you. So please don't do that. Don't try to slow things down. Don't try and put a bandage on it. I mean, I guess it's a bleeding. Go ahead and we'll put a pressure. But the more pressure you put on a system that ha has already been envenomated, it's already gone to work to be damaged. Anything that we do to either cut off blood supply, put pressure to move the venom in different places, um, we have good intentions and we want to help our pets. Um, but keeping their blood pressure down, keeping their activity level down is the best thing we can do for them on the way to the hospital. And if you have a buddy in the car with you, have them call the emergency hospital and let them know you're on the way because you do need an emergency team waiting for a snake bit animal. You do. Yeah. Um, when I was in Vegas, I took all the um, <laughs> um, snake um, vaccine classes and they were being taught by a woman that was a partner in this rattlesnake vaccine company and she was telling all these stories and she <laughs> told the story with pictures about this um, mastiff type dog that had gotten bit by a rattlesnake and several times yeah there, there you go yeah and um and the met the dog got mad and went after the snake and bit the snake and the snake continued to bite him the dog ate the snake so they bring the dog completely swollen up an english mouth English mass, some sort of massive. The dog gets to the emergency hospital and vomits up the snake. 
so in a couple parts and the staff went to go clean up the snake mm. before treating the dog so the problem with that story is that if a rattlesnake regardless of the type is dead if you touch their fangs you can still become envenomated so, and that, that would be what a triple problem that would be my dog ate the snake that tried to bite it i'm on the emergency hospital then the staff picks up the snake that my dog just vomited up and had to go to the hospital for getting envenomated by a snake so um, just try and keep a level head and do not try and go get the snake. Don't try and take pictures of the snake that bit your dog. Just tell the animal hospital that your dog got bit by a snake because the treatment for those snake bites is going to be pretty much the same regardless of what kind of snake bit your dog. There was some controversy about the green Mojaves versus the other snakes in Arizona and the type of anti-venom anti -venom you can get from emergency hospitals, um, human hospitals, and um, it turns out that the amount of anti-venom variety uh, in the A anti-venom in human hospitals will give some sort of help, not necessarily immunity, but help in neutralizing, deactivating even the green Mojave uh, venom, which um, is a very scary thing because green Mojaves have, no, there we go. Um, green Mojaves, so, so scary. They have um, neurotoxins as well as um, um, hematic um, toxins. So it not just goes up to your muscles, uh, it goes out to your nervous system, goes out to your bloodstream, and um, um, they're harder to neutralize, and the venom stays in the system a lot longer, so it's not like you are cleared when you get out of the emergency hospital. You have uh, delayed response tissue damage um, and neurological damage, and sometimes, um, um, uh, um, I actually had a couple dogs die of this up in um, Prescott when I was working up there and you didn't you didn't see it for like three days and um, they ended up dying of renal failure to be honest with you uh, because the systems were multi-system organ failure two days after they got bitten and they got cleared from the hospital so it's tricky um, I'd say most of the emergency hospitals around here now hospitalize for several days mm -hmm. before they're even released how much does several days of hospitalization in an emergency hospital cost a lot yeah what are we doing? What, like, what, yeah. Seriously, what are we doing? A thousand dollars a night? I, you know, I couldn't tell you the exact amount, mm -hmm. but I'm sure it's it's at least that. Yeah. Because with, and and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's uh, a lot of blood clotting um, follow up blood work that there you do every to, couple of hours. There has to be. Um, so that's expensive, and if you're doing that every couple hours every single day, that's I mean that should add up. Yeah. Plus all of the monitoring that they're doing on, on other parts. Uh, so. no, absolutely, and the, so. There, um, at this point in time, there are um, rattlesnake vaccines, mm -hmm. and um, the rattlesnake vaccines, um, they of course have not had um, um, controlled studies because that, I can't even imagine how that would get done, uh, but they don't have controlled studies, but um, there has been evidence that um, giving the rattlesnake vaccine does increase the dog's immune system to make um, um, some sort of resistance to the bite, the venom. Just the same reason we give vaccines for everything else, right? Some sort of immune system response to parvo or distemper or rabies, those types of things. Not quite the same because this is venom, not a virus. But the principle is the same. So if your dog has got the rabies, the rabies, pardon me, um, the uh, rattlesnake vaccine, uh, some protection. All it does is decrease the severity, hopefully, and increase the amount of time you have to get to the hospital with minimal damage. And that, that's, that's all. Uh, we're not looking for resistance to rattlesnakes. It's not like that. And uh, the current thought, it changes often, is that rattlesnake vaccines, um, the first time you do it, it's two. And then some places that have high occurrence of uh, rattlesnake bites are saying that you have to get the vaccine 30 days before rattlesnake season mm -hmm. to give a bump, you know, like a booster. And if you're in a place that has rattlesnakes or venomous animals all year long, that it'll be every six months you get it done, not every year. And that's a protocol that I'm not really sure where that's in place or where that where that puts us with regard to our snake population and things like that. But I do know we carry rattlesnake vaccine yes. at Bark Avenue, if that's correct. And the protocols for those, I'll be frank with you, um, my exposure to giving those vaccinations has been minimal here. Not a heck of a lot of people asking, mostly if they're traveling or those types. But um, if the side effects of the rattlesnake vaccine have been reported to be extremely minimal, one in 3,000 um, gets a bump at the site. And then um, 
There's a couple that have had like low-grade fevers, things like that, that is exactly the same of vaccine reactions to any other kind of vaccine, not just rattlesnake vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a nice form of protection um, to some degree. But the sense of protection that people get with having rattlesnake vaccines, we have to make sure that we educate people and let you know that it gives you some sense of maybe the tissue damage won't be so bad. But we don't know what the tissue damage is before because we don't know the age of the pet. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, the age of the um, snake because younger snakes have higher venom loads. If it's a um, offensive attack, higher venom load. If it is a second bite of the day, that is a higher venom load. So if I bit somebody and then somebody scared me and I went and bit somebody else, that second attack is thought to have a higher venom load than the previous. Um, age of the animal, health status of the animal, the site of the bite, um, the amount of blood flow, um, high blood pressure, those types of things, and the health of the animal overall um, it all play a role in what kind of tissue damage we're going to get because we are going to get tissue damage because it's a venom um, stuck into soft tissue and functional tissues that swell. And so the amount of pain, the amount of discomfort, and the amount of recovery time is possibly going to be vast. Um, so those types of things that we can do for our animals. First of all, it's going to be the aversion training. It's going to be possibly vaccines. You need to ask your veterinarian, regardless of who that is, about their vac rattlesnake vaccine protocols and do they separate them from other vaccines? They keep track of them. Where do you live? Are you going to get them um, a month before rattlesnake season or when this rattlesnakes every year? It's definitely a conversation to have with your vet because it is, it's a lifestyle vaccine. This is not yes. a vaccine that we give every single patient. This is not a vaccine we recommend that every patient gets. So strictly a lifestyle vaccine. Are, is your pet uh, at risk on, based on your lifestyle with your pet um, during rattlesnake season? Or snake season. Snake, you know, snake season at all, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and that being said, the fact that um, the rattlers are, aren't the only ones that envenomate dogs and cats, um, and I honestly am not sure about the crossover to other venomous animals, and I do believe that there's a snake specific um, based on the two types of snakes that we have both here and in California. So um, it's another question to ask for safety and security with regard to where do you live and what kind of creatures are in your backyard and those types of things. And, uh, um, preparing for today, I actually learned a lot about scorpions. Um, probably, probably, <laughs> like, probably, probably more, like, a lot about scorpions. I'm like, oh my god. We've gosh. got a question from yes, Cassandra. Please. She wants to know what is snake season? Darn fine question. I know we're in the middle of it right now. Um, and I don't actually think, except for when it gets cold, that we actually have an issue with snakes not being here. Um, if they go into hibernation, they go into hibernation. But I do know when we go up north um, and. <laughs> um, the Flagstaffs and the um, Sedonas of the world, different seasons, and sometimes you can get the snakes out early and you can get them, actually I went hiking the other day up in the Mogollon Ram and I saw one and it was stuck in a shelf between two rocks mm -hmm. and my dog went Always. thing past it. I was like, okay, I'm gonna leave right now. I'm, like, I'm, so, <laughs> I'm so sorry you were sleeping just then. Um, I think it fluctuates and um, I would actually check that and I do know that um, rattlesnake migration is another period of time in which does rattlers show up in different spots than you would normally expect them to be in. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, what do the temperatures get down here? 70s maybe? You know, yeah. um, so I apologize, I don't have the exact right answer for you, but we I've will find out. I've always been told, at least in the Phoenix metro area, mm -hmm. we don't have oh. a non-snake season. That's right. Um, and so, yeah, it might be a little bit specific to your geographic region. If you're more Traveling into the mountains too. area, you'll probably have a more of a snake load. Uh, whereas if you're in the middle of Phoenix, you probably don't have uh, as much snakes around. But mm -hmm. really, there's not a snake season in the Phoenix metro area. Um, like Dr. O said, when you go up north and you have a big temperature drop, um, those snakes go into hibernation. I think that you do have a snake season. And so a lot of the recommendations we've made um, towards the vaccine had been on the every six months just as a um, precaution. precaution. That's right. Especially with the lifestyle. If you're hiking more in the winter time, because that's when it's more comfortable, you actually still have uh, snakes out there. They're Definitely. probably not going to be out there as prevalent as in the, the, the warmer temperatures, but they're still out there and they're more hidden. And they're more slow. Yeah. When they go to travel or migrate, and I was up um, in um, Dewey, Humble, and that you get these snakes migrating, and they actually like migrate across your driveway. I mean, they're just like, they're just like, they're like, just snakes are coming, you know, and, and, um, and they're much more slow. 
but that makes them um, for like opportunistic dogs and things like that and we'll go after them. It doesn't mean they're not going to defend themselves. It just means that um, they will be there. They're just not going to be in the place that they want to hide as yeah. quickly. Um, and like I said, we'll have um, posted a bunch of organizations that will know more specifically about what snakes are doing in different areas because they're the ones that are going out there and um, getting them out of houses or getting them out of situations so people don't kill them. Check the comment section. I've sent a couple links out there on um, Snake Remediation Company here great. in the Mesa. Great. Um, the snake aversion training that Dr. O recommended. Um, great people there. Yeah. We'll maybe try and get them as a guest. We'll yeah, we'll to be frank with you, I, I was hoping to get them as a guest and ask them to bring one of their snakes in because I mean, it's like the freak out factor, right? Because <laughs> there's a rattlesnake and, and Ron's going to be over there. If I will happens. be over there. <laughs> uh, but the idea that kind of... Um, to talk to people that do it and um, are uh, adverse uh, to cruelty to animals to some degree and making sure that um, your education towards your choices um, takes that into account because it's not the rattlesnake's fault. We're the ones that are in their backyard and hurting them or killing them or debilitating them or making them unable to be snakes when they get done with their like rattlesnake aversion training. It just depends on where you're at on that scale with animal cruelty because it's not the snake's fault. We're in their home. Um, and. Like I said, I did a version training with my dogs and invited them to come up to where I was two or three times. And um, regardless of how many screens between you and the snake, they're still impressively scary. And I, they, although, that being said, um, at one of the training sessions I um, uh, witnessed, there was a um, schnauzer, a young schnauzer, and they went to go bring it you know, do their aversion training, and this schnauzer would not back down. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would not back down. That would be how my terriers would be. I would but scary, I mean, so scary, They would probably right? get bit and still not back down. Yeah. I, so aggressively into the snake, and the snake, and the snake actually got tired, was just like, okay, you know what, I know you're right there, but, you know, um, the staff that was working with this dog actually gave the dog, you know, at the end, gave this dog back to this owner and said, please, I don't know what we could possibly do to keep this dog from going after a snake. So, you know, they, they recommended other kinds of precautions. Um, and one of them is keep your dog on a leash. You know, so how, how do you not do that recommendation? How do you not do it in the real world? Uh, I'm a violator, I'll be honest with you. Um, but we don't know where the snake's gonna be. There could be in the yards, they're right outside the houses where, I, you know, like you were saying, in your garage is a big one. But I know in my neighborhood, um, all of a sudden we, it, like the, the Facebook posts on our neighborhood mm -hmm. group, it just went wild. Oh, snake in the in the driveway, snake in the garage. And so that's definitely one place I never thought about having a snake. I've definitely cautious been lifting rocks or, you know, moving things that have been there a long time in my backyard. But um, the garage is not a place where I would have thought. And it's apparently cool the back it. of the um, hot water heater seems to be a really good place for them to hide. So, yeah, see, that, so those are kind of scary things because yeah. I, I would never think about I doing know. that. They, um, well, I grew up in San Diego, like I said, and um, the word was, don't go in the garage. And whatever it's like, don't go in the garage, you know, you walked out there and it was just, and the rattlers were just sitting there, you know, just like in the garage doing their thing. And they would just sit there and be like, doo, 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 doo. And as soon as you moved towards them, not knowing, you heard the rattler and you went, oh, and you turned around and went, it wouldn't matter where it was in the house, you'd hear that rattler, you're like, oh, oh. okay. And then just back, like back away, like you're in a movie, like, Okay, it's, it's all yours you do whatever you want <laughs> so they deserve a lot of respect and we're in their homes and there are certain things that we can do um, like we mentioned but the the big deal is that if you think your pet has gotten bit by anything please have the phone number to the emergency hospitals in ready access write it on your dashboard write it in your you know write it on your hand write it get it in your phone uh, whatever you have to do or and get a buddy system call your best friend say hey so my you know charlie's been bit by a snake i think we're on our way to emergency hospital can you meet me somewhere and have them make the phone call to emergency hospital yeah. so you can drive safely because it's important especially the kind of traffic that we have down here on um, our webpage, barkatpet.com there is a resource section and we have all of the closest emergency clinics awesome. around us right in one spot for you so if you can print that out or uh, we have uh, listed on our phone number for emergency um, and we have some pamphlets so if you don't want to go there and you want to come to us for a pamphlet we have those available to you um, lots of resources from us to give to you the other um, um, surprise is when if if this happens to you and your pets and you get to the emergency hospital and they're going to be doing their blood work they're going to be doing pain management we're going to IV fluids they're going to be what are doing whatever it is that they feel is appropriate for 
the basically the blood work results of your animal and your pain score of your animal, those types of things. Um, but they'll have a, maybe have a conversation with you about doing anti-venom and whether or not they carry it in their hospital. I'm unsure as to who carries that here with regard to the emergency hospitals. And uh, right now, um, uh, the most the the most current numbers uh, per vial are somewhere around seven hundred thirty dollars, and getting them from a human hospital, at least in my experience in Vegas, I haven't had any rattlesnake bites here. I've had a couple of deaths that I wasn't involved with uh, directly here in Prescott, Arizona. But when I was in Vegas, we were spending about eight hundred thirty dollars a vial, and in theory, a vial should neutralize the venom of one snake bite. In theory, and um, depending on how big the animal is, how aggressive the blood work abnormalities are, and the pain of the animal, even in small dogs. I remember we had one, um, um, the fawn and black, oh, small dogs, what the heck are they, smush face? Uh, Pekingese? No. No, bigger than that. Um, Pug. Pug, it was a pug, pug. thank you. Um, <laughs> somebody called our hospital and they said, my dog's been bitten by a snake. And we, they, drove, they came to the front door, we're like, okay, we don't have the supplies here. So we went to a human hospital and we were we ended up spending, I think it was like 800 plus dollars per mm -hmm. vial. So um, many times when, hum, when humans when humans walk in the hospital and they get estimates for how much things are gonna cost, um, they're surprised. So um, beware um, when we go to an emergency hospital and they say whether they have it or they're going to have to go to a human hospital to get it, it is going to be pricey and the results of those types of treatments are variable. I mean, they're variable. Um, and we're hoping for the best in the worst situations and sometimes these animals do great. Um, it's just that the earlier you get to the hospital in order to treat the clinical signs that happen. You're not treating the bite, you're treating you're trying to neutralize it, you're trying to neutralize the damage, and the blood dyscrasias, the abnormalities, the long-term destruction of tissue, and God forbid the neurological side effects and the hematological side effects, those are the things that these guys, like you were saying, are gonna be doing blood work on over and over again, and you're basically being reactive, it's reactive medicine, based on what's happening with your animal. And the pain management, I was taught in a, <laughs> up north from an emergency doctor, they said, so, Snake bites, we get in the hospital and do IV catheter, pain management, pain management, pain management, pull some blood, pain management, pain management, pull some blood, pain management. Call the owner. And I mean, that, that was it, that was it. It's like, control right. these dogs' pain because yeah. the, with their, their blood pressure going up and moving that venom to all kinds of places that we cannot stop it, it's important. So these emergency people, um, they're they're um, they're lifesavers. Make no mistake about it. When they when they come up with issues like this, of course they're lifesavers all the time. But knowing what to do, um, and me not knowing what to do, or clients not knowing what to do, other than panicking, trust them. I mean, listen to what they say and trust them because stopping these things, and then the the, um, the idea that the next time your dog sees a snake, that they're going to act normally or they're going to act <laughs> like like I'm not going hiking, I'm not going camping, I am not going in those bushes anymore. That would be a normal. Um, post-traumatic anxiety response, and we can talk about that later. Um, we might bring some people in that can talk about that, not only with snake bites, but other kinds of unexpected, painful experiences with dogs. And also, this does happen with cats. Um, trying to get a cat that got a snake bite controlled and not biting you to transport to a hospital, I don't know the right answer to that. I do know if you carry cat goes anywhere, this would be your house, this would be your garage, this would mm -hmm. be in your backyard. Um, swelling, pain, bleeding dilated pupils. Um, I would imagine quite a bit of vocalization and collapse, heat stroke, things like that because to have the venom go through a small little body like that would be, uh, it would be a tantamount emergency. Um, so that's kind of information. I know that it seems a little broad spectrum. It's just going to be case by case, but keeping yourself together and not panicking and not Screaming, screaming, screaming. Don't, don't scream. I, I get over the screaming and then I react. <laughs> if that's any help. <laughs> so as we pointed out at the beginning of this, time is of the essence, so don't yeah. do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I hope maybe you have a buddy with you or those types of things. But um, that know that this is, hopefully it will never happen to you, but we chose to live in a place where snakes are everywhere. Um, and so this will be an ongoing issue and hopefully we will not be killing the snakes. We'll have the remediation thing going on here, all the emergency hospitals. Talk to your veterinarian about getting uh, vaccinated if that's what you'd like to do. Um, and first aid kits, we should talk about that. Um, 
I, when I go hiking, I'm not anywhere near my car. I mean, I'm not. I'm not. Yeah. I got my phone with me, but I'm not. A couple hours into your hike. Oh my gosh, yes. Um, so the idea of um, if my dog goes down, if my dog's too painful to walk, if my if my dog is in trouble, the blood pressure is so high, those types of things going on. Um, there are some. There's are there are some like holistic things for pain. There's some. Um, um, yeah, there are some holistic things for pain. Um, the question is, do you want to stick your finger in the mouth or on the lips of an animal that just got bit by a snake? You know, with that pain response, anxiety response, do you want to do anything that will increase this animal's blood pressure because you want to manipulate them? Um, it's a difficult question. How do you transport your animal out of a situation where they have been bitten by a snake? How do you prepare for that? How do you calmly move your animal like I have what 70 pounders easy how do i move a down 70 pounder how do i splint an animal how do i keep their blood pressure down how do i do these things to help my animal get to the car to get to the emergency hospital i don't have the answers to that for you i have the answers for me because i actually <laughs> i need to deadlift them over my shoulders unfortunately i've had to do it a couple times um with regard to stuff you have in your backpack, are you going to drag them out? Are you going to, what are you going to do to move your animal if you don't hike with a buddy? Are you going to have your buddy on a phone to call them and say, hey, I'm up on hiking trail, whatever, whatever. My dog just got bit by a snake. I need help and get somebody there. Um, if you get a hold of the place where you hike, you know, a lot of times you can sign, um, there's, little, there's, um, the piece of paper that has your name and your phone number and it tells you tell people what trail you're on so that the um, forest service or the people that are actually just custodian the tracks and so like that they would know um, and if you have a phone a lot of times i find that carrying a whistle when you're hiking is a lifesaver oh, yeah. honestly if you get hurt your dog gets hurt something's going on having a what do you call them rape whistles safety whistles emergency whistles carry those with you 100 percent because even if they get the attention of a stranger who cares mm -hmm. get some help or get the phone or make sure you have phone service where you are and it seems like a lot of preparatory work but when it comes right down to it and it's that emergency where he's screaming and somebody else is trying to make the phone calls. Those types I of things. I can't whistle if I'm screaming. Like, I need to breathe. I mean, I guess the thing is to bring a buddy with him to blow the whistle or two. Um, but thinking outside the box, thinking about how is it that you're going to help your pet get to your car? How are you going to get the car? You know, those types of things. Are you strong enough to lift your pet? Are you strong enough to do the 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 whole? Indian kind of carrying papoose thing. Do you tell your neighbors that you're going hiking? What do you do to make sure that it's safe first? And always, always, always carry water. Not only for heat stroke, which we'll talk about next time, which is um, critical, um, but do you flush the wound? Do you give your dog water? Heck yeah, of course you give your dog water. When they have a heat flash because they just got bit by a snake and you're trying to keep their blood pressure down, do you, in the hottest temperatures for your black lab that's down and painful, do you pour water over them to cool them down a little? Sure, that's not going to hurt them if it doesn't slow the progress to get back to your car. But having water at all times for these guys for many different medical reasons, as well as for yourself, because if you're having a little panic attack and trying to get your animal to the car, um, or making the phone calls or blowing your whistle or yelling, whatever it is that we're going to be doing. Um, water's going to be critical and you cannot go wrong with that with regard to helping your animal topically or orally. It doesn't mean flush the wound. It doesn't mean anything like that. It just means make sure that you have that ability to keep your animal from going into shock. And that's the God's truth because um, these animals will go into shock and then you have a really big problem for you to handle on your own in the car while you're driving. And I didn't make, mean to make this seem so... So um, devastating, but it is. It is. Um, mm -hmm. It is. Um, know yeah. that in Phoenix metro area, you are not allowed to take your dogs hiking when it is over a hundred degrees. So know that is a, as a. I don't know if that's a Maricopa County law, but I know that is Phoenix metro. You are not allowed to go hiking. The hiking trails are closed to pets once it reaches a hundred degrees. Because of the snakes or because of the heat stroke because or because of, heat, of I would imagine all, all of the above, but I would I think heat is number one. Yeah, um, and all those things are they're critically important. And um, with regard to our rattlesnakes, the thing is that you're hiking in 100 degree heat and your blood pressure's up and you're trying to ventilate and you're trying to sweat and you're trying to this. Remember your dogs don't sweat, okay? So all the activity of cooling is going on inside of them, which means that their blood pressure is high, which means they're trying to pant and ventilate and all that increases their blood pressure, which 
in that situation getting a snake bite when you have that kind of blood flow going on would not be the best situation um, so make sure that you're prepared and whether that means you have some first aid you have some communication you have somebody that knows where you've been and you have all the emergency phone numbers it's really really important um, and be prepared to um, uh, be in the hospital for a while um, and, and even the, the um, most rapid snake bite treatments that I've seen in I hate to say it 13 years um, is 48 hours and sometimes you can send people home to do treatments at home but you have to come recheck the blood work like you were saying and these animals are painful and um, I have to highly advise that um, home treatments I wouldn't do it so I have a question for you then. So I, I would imagine there's not like a great holistic approach to treating a snake bite wound in an emergency situation as far as like in the hospital. But what is something like uh, holistically we can do or, you know, as that patient comes out of the hospital and is now back into just recovering from that snake bite, what are the things that you recommend? So, um, that's funny that we say that. Um, there, are, <laughs> there are some homeopathics that are specifically marketed for um, snake bites and acrotalus and arnica for pain right we know arnica for pain um, hyperica nerve pain we know that the snake bites are gonna cause nerve pain and then echinacea is also used for traditional for snake bites um, for immune system support for the internal issues for snake bites and once again these are not a substitute for getting to an emergency hospital these are things like you were saying once we get out of the hospital we're going to want to have as much pain management on board uh, what your veterinarians tell you to do as well as possibly doing some homeopathics um, and those right there the arnica the um, hypericum and this um, the other kind of the croteus and things like that those are homeopathic for snake bites and most of the time uh, homeopathics are like treats like we're not looking to treat anything that's why I don't encourage it um, but then echinacea is an immune booster is to help your animal to recover from a traumatic um, event that's causing issues in places that we won't know uh, for days and days and days um, soft to food tons and tons of water high protein um, low um, low reactive carbohydrates and nothing that would um, give your animal in theory uh, diarrhea we don't want to lose more water because the thing with um, the swelling of rattlesnake bites as well as some other creatures is that the amount of body water that immediately goes to an area of swelling whether it's their face or their legs the body is pulling water from other essential organs to make the swelling to battle what's going on with the venom um, going into hypo bulimic shock because the fluid levels in essential organs is going away rapidly to go to swollen areas is an absolute side effect of rattlesnakes and other kinds of um, situations but when it comes time to leave the hospital it's possible that based on what your doctor says that we will be increasing the volume of water and fluids in your dog and whether that means it's going to be extra water it's going to mean um, uh, soaked down hydrated foods it's going to be that we give them broths all the time those types of um, water uh, increasing um, foods um, but we also have to be careful with whatever your veterinarian says about high salt foods so when we choose our broths we choose our foods i'm not sure that we want to be doing high salt to increase water volume or swelling anywhere else but it's going to be case to case basis but know that the amount of swim that goes on like that for a rattlesnake and other kinds of bites and other kinds of accidents it's pulling water from essential organs uh, multi-system multi-organ function to go to the skin to go to the tissues that are poisoned envenomated i apologize um, and it's pulling those away from serviceable organs and also the flushing filtering and uh, cleansing organs of our body are being deprived of fluids so uh, making sure that you have that um, in your mind as you're feeding these guys back or they're going to be it's going to be emergency feedbacks things like that and essential fluid restorations and that takes it can be a very very long time days to weeks at least um, but that was a very good question like i said the homeopathics i do like them very much but um western medicine in my mind is the only way to go when you get into certain kinds of emergencies and especially if it risks you putting your hand near the mouth of an animal that has got bitten, bitten has been hurt, um, if there's any chance you're going to be bitten by your painful, scared animal, I encourage you not to risk it because after they're feeling better and they have pain management on board, 
then you can move forward with that as far as I'm concerned because having you have a secondary problem and risking your animal being in trouble for biting you because that's always the way it goes, right? Because your dog bites you, who's in trouble? Your dog is in trouble. You're not in trouble. Your dog's in trouble. Does your dog have a rabies vaccine? Did your dog bite you in a vicious way? Is animal control going to be in, uh, involved? When you get to the emergency hospital, they're going to ask you who bit you and this, that, and everything. It's, everyone's doing their job. It's just that if we keep ourselves out of harm's way by not getting in the face of animals that are hurt, even trying to get muzzles on them because they're going to need to bang out, they're going to need to breathe, they're going to need to do a lot of things, and you need to keep your hands away from them just to keep them out of trouble. So um, it can be hard, and that's where, like, um, using blankets and having those types of things and using the adaptals of the world might be helpful, um, but being prepared to come face-to-face -face with something like that just because we live in Arizona, which is filled with snakes. So it's not... Not very helpful and we don't actually know when it's going to happen but having that in the trunk of your car those types of things would be very helpful um, yeah I'm trying to think of anything else that we can say that would be broad spectrum and safe but it would be on a case-by-case -case recovery basis because we don't know what's going to happen to these guys so but like I said pain management pain management pain management, pain management, pain management. and also the idea of giving your dogs aspirin I know I heard that a lot when I was up um, working in different places we have no idea what kind of blood dyscrasias, blood abnormalities are going to happen with rattlesnake bites or any other kind of venomous animals. And aspirin, as we know, can cause its own kinds of bleeding disorders, right? right. So the idea of using something that we know causes bleeding disorders in an animal that just got bit by a snake that might be causing blood dyscrasias anyway, we don't want to add to the problem. I know we all want to help with the pain. We all want to help our animals feel better. We all want to hope that that just didn't happen. And what can I do to make my animal feel better now? Call the emergency hospital. Call poison control right away and just say, my dog just got bit, what can I do from the car? And see if they come up, they're gonna come up with a whole get to the emergency hospital. That, that's gonna be the answer, I would guess. But the idea of getting them something out of your wallet or your purse or out of your car, um, I just don't know that that wouldn't cause more problems at the emergency hospital or unfortunately, if there's any bleeding disorders going on because of the bite. I'm trying to reverse bleeding disorders for anyone that's ever had that happen or been in a hospital where a veterinarian had to tell you what we have to do to help your pet when they have bleeding disorders. Um, it's, it gets tricky, and um, being bit by a snake is not tricky enough. Um, trying to do blood transfusions, trying to do um, clotting profiles, trying to do um, injectable meds on top of the possibility of failures, because if your organs don't get enough oxygen because your red blood cell count's not high enough to facilitate corrections with your rattlesnake swelling, things like that, it just gets very complicated. Um, so we do what the professionals say, you know, regardless of what, how far away you are from them. So um, it's basically like, be prepared, don't get bitten, help your animals not get bitten in the first place, and then get to the darn emergency hospital even by phone and or get driving there as safely as possible. Um, I think it just sucked up all your time. I apologize. Um, we will do heat stroke um, next week, and it is um, critically important. I think um, I've had a couple heat stroke cases here already. Um, and there are things like people walking down the street. Yeah. Uh, people, there was one person that was in front of the hospital that was walking around too much for the size, the shape, the health, and the obesity status of their animal and or heart problems and or inability to breathe if I could squish face dogs. Um, and it can happen, like you were saying, in your, in your garage, in your own backyard. Mm -hmm. And that um, now, what was it, a week ago, the heat was, I think, 105, 105 108. Yeah. And, um, Unfortunately, a couple of our chickens were having a hard time with that, too. They're like, whoo, turn the sprinklers on. Uh, they were, right? And I was like, oh, my gosh, get the fans going. Um, so please um, um, spread the information. Please share the information that Ron's put on our website about the remediation. And I really don't want these snakes or any of these animals being killed because of this. This is their backyard, not ours. So anything we can do to help them get to a safer place now that we're here and not get our dogs or our cats or our humans, of course, bitten by snakes, um, would be a very it's be a good use of time. I you know I just hate seeing these snakes killed because it's not their fault to be honest with you. So any other comments that you would have to say about your snakes? No, I think we'll segue into some of that. Um, what you should have on a hike as far as a, a first aid kit, mm -hmm. you know, um, preparation for that, um, and that kind of leads in with snakes as well as the heat. And yeah, so absolutely. We'll come back next week. We'll discuss heat stroke, um, hiking in the heat. Um, and things that you can do at home to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Um, 
And then how is it that we're helping people get into some of the like care free product? I mean, fear free products. Mm -hmm. um, we have do we have a list of like the um, adaptals and the uh, feel aways and things like that that might be helpful in their cars? Yeah, right now off our website, we do have under the resources, the fear free, um, what we are working on, and that is being built upon every day. And so we'll have some product recommendations on that. Uh, and we yeah. may add it to our little list of, um, uh, of uh, well, I just lost first the aid, train of thought. The first, first aid, aid kit. Absolutely. Yeah. So we may add some products to the first aid kit that, we, that you recommended in the past. So. Beautiful. And the thing is that if my friends with the rattlesnakes um, make contact and they show up I'm gonna invite them to come on our show and uh, hopefully Ron will send out the I'll be talking about from the background because <laughs> it'll, be it'll be nice to get the information from people that actually um, deal with the snakes and have yeah. more life experience with the snakes and teaching people about the um, um, aversion training and how it is that they feel that they get best results and um, some of the stories that they have to tell and they're they're the, they're the guys that actually deal with the snakes and um, know what the snakes behavior is and stuff um, and we'll see if they could possibly be one and bring one in to scare Ron a little bit but um, um it, I've eaten rattlesnake oh see how is that helpful that's like saying he ate his dog I don't really know how that's helpful today um, and so like, when they come don't tell them that um, but so hopefully we can get as much information to you guys as possible that um, answers all your questions and especially about aversion training so it's, I think it's important I did it with my dogs and um since I don't have many boundaries with my dogs and we go everywhere and we go up north and we go hiking all the time, um, it's, it's important. I'm, I'm not sure how well it sticks. I'm not sure under the emergency situations. It's just that doing everything we can do to help these guys not end up in the emergency hospital and not end up with those huge bills where people have to make decisions. But there, there's huge decisions, right? And how am I going to, where am I going to come up with a two grand to tell my dog? Or how am I gonna, and are they going to recover? Are they going to limp again? We don't know the answers to those things. We can't answer those. But um, offering you guys as much information on all the services, not only to save the snake, but to save your dogs and to save your hands. Um, that's hopefully what you got from today. Um, it's just that there's a lot more information to be able to answer your questions. And there's so many in, um, things on the 17 different snakes. Um, it's nice to know the difference between them. It's, they all look like that. I don't know. I can't Maybe tell the difference, but apparently there is a way to tell the difference. I don't want to get close enough to find out. Well, you know what? I'll try to bring a snake in for you <laughs> soon. Um, thank you guys for watching, and I appreciate your time, and we'll be seeing you next week about heat stroke and some uh, rollovers from this. And like I said, if, um, if the rattlesnakes show up, um, we'll be having them here for you. And don't forget, if you have any questions or you have uh, topic suggestions you'd like us to cover, um, you can email us, uh, ron at barkedpet.com, Dr. O. Sullivan, or it's D-R O. Sullivan, at uh, barkedpet.com. We're happy to take your suggestions, um, turn them into a good topic to talk about. So please feel free to send those in, and we will see you next week. Thank Bye, you. guys. Thank you. Thanks.